Hey folks, this is Dr. Emily Sterning with American Resiliency. We've got just a short video today talking about non-climate hazards, starting with quakes and nukes. I think many of us who are considering destinations, we might want some access to these classes of information. We're gonna do a very basic overview today. And this is a situation where you're the ones driving the bus. I've had many people in the community reach out to me wanting information on classes of hazards beyond climate. But there are a lot of areas where I don't have expertise, so I feel very fortunate. I feel very fortunate. We have a volunteer who is an expert on hazards, who works in disaster response, and who would prefer to keep their identity discreet. This person is working to put together information on at-risk infrastructure, which they will use to help me take a look at different regions in the U.S. and identify critical vulnerabilities, like at-risk dams and their downstream population centers. We also hope to put together regional information on water and soil contamination and pollution, which are concerns worth noting in many potential destination areas. I expect we'll be putting that information out over the next year or so. The detail required for the infrastructure work in particular, it's exceptional. It often requires access to physical information sources. It's not information anyone is going to be able to pull out with AI, and I wouldn't be able to do it. I'm so grateful for the work our hazards expert is doing for us all and for the opportunity to give a voice to share this knowledge to our community. I do feel compelled to say also how grateful I am to the community as a whole. The specialized knowledge we're able to share with each other, what we can build together, it's special. I feel like we're making something that's good in the world. And that is awesome, but let's get to work. The expert told me, hey, while we're building up more complex regional content on these infrastructure risks, let's at least get people thinking about it. And we can start with this compelling topic of earthquakes and nuclear sites. And I have to admit, quakes and nukes is a compelling combination. Let's get to it. First, earthquakes. As a Midwesterner, earthquakes scare me. If you check out this figure, which is from the USGS, which is our nation's geological service, totally solid earth science people, they put together this figure it shows how often you get big shakes in different parts of the country. And I'm sure you will notice we've got some pretty nice overlay with the Northern Midwest destination region, one of the best potential lifeboat regions in the world with great water, a reasonable cost of living, and many terrifying weathered hazards available in all seasons. However, no earthquakes. Please note the time scale on the figure here. This is a serious rock person figure. We're looking at a 10,000 year time scale. Damaging earthquakes can be felt anywhere on our dynamic planet, but in this key destination area, drilling really down here on the northern Midwest, you can expect less than two damaging earthquakes every 10,000 years. Some folks worry about earthquakes in the Midwest because they remember the extremely freaky event that was the New Madrid earthquakes of 1811 to 1812. As you can see in this period engraving reproduced on Wikipedia, this earthquake caused many sheds to fall over. More seriously, this was actually an extremely intense regional event that caused the Mississippi River to flow backwards all the way up to Minnesota. The extreme shaking caused ground liquefaction. It broke basically everything. And when that fault goes again, we would expect a very bad day indeed in the St. Louis Metro. This is a possibility they teach us in school if you grow up in the Midwest. But you can see if you're a person who's concerned about the New Madrid, that the New Madrid fault actually has a fairly limited locus of major action, as we can see on this USGS figure. Which let's get back to that and look at that. We can see where that New Madrid epicenter is, right there down in the tip of Missouri. And we can see that it does not extend, its range of shake doesn't really extend well up into your best destination territory areas for the Northern Midwest, which is cool. I'm thinking more about places where a person might wanna go as we enter a higher period of climate risk, you can see that, as you might know, there's a pretty crazy level of earthquake risk in the Pacific Northwest. We are aware of a cycle of major earthquakes and associated tsunamis that occur every 300 to 400 years in that area. And because of course we are, we are due for another major shake in that area. If you've ever visited coastal Washington, 
You've seen these tsunami evacuation route signs all over, anywhere by the beach, anywhere by the ocean. And that's because this is a well understood regional risk. There are strong indigenous teachings on this matter as well. You may have heard that in Japan, there are ancient stones that mark tsunami danger lines. In the Pacific Northwest, we have a similar tradition in the land, a similar indigenous tradition. There is human memory of the last time this happened. Long story short, it was not fun. There are many stories that go basically about a man or a woman who was out at sea, a great wave took their craft into a tree, way up into one of those giant trees that they have along the coast in the Pacific Northwest. And they're like, what happened to me? I'm so banged up, but not dead. And now I gotta get down from this tree. And then this woman says she comes down into a world that is washed with chaos. People find each other as best they can to build a new world, to build new community buildings well back beyond the path of that wave. And the tribal nations in the area in the Pacific Northwest, their communal buildings are built beyond the path of the wave. They preserve this memory of where it's safe to build today. When we get a big slip of that fault, if that should happen again, which is likely, it is impossible to say how many people will die. The wave will impact urban areas. Hopefully we'll have some warning but even so, the humanitarian crisis, even if we get as good an evacuation as we could, it's going to be substantial. Millions of people will need enormous amounts of assistance to get back on their feet in the Pacific Northwest when we have another slip of this fault. Looking to the southeast, which it is worth highlighting some parts of Appalachia, if you are tough as a nut and like being poor, there are some good destinations in Appalachia. You will notice in that region a present but not super spooky earthquake risk. It's not as bad as the Pacific Northwest. And that extends all the way up through potential destinations in the Northeast, with one exception, Pennsylvania. And I'm going to admit that I mostly know about Pennsylvania from watching Always Sunny. So it's always surprising and nice to me when it turns out that Pennsylvania is maybe actually a charming state. Pennsylvania looks great in the climate outlook and your Midwest quality super low earthquake zone overlays a decent chunk of your best preserved territory in terms of 2C projections. Also notice please there in Pennsylvania your absence of nuclear sites. Now, I'm not here to get into a big debate or blather about nuclear power. I'm here addressing a frequently mentioned concern brought up by like a dozen people over the last two months about where are the locations of nuclear sites. If you don't want to be by one, this is the map for you. If you love nuclear sites and want to cleave to their sweet, sweet power, this is also a great map. This map from Gao Analysis is a starting point for those of you who want this information. Density of sites might concern or interest you, in which case you might be surprised by how many nuclear sites there are along the Northeast coast. Many of these sites are potentially quite vulnerable to sea level rise, even in lower end sea level rise scenarios. However, density isn't the only safety concern. We see only a few sites to the West, but in Washington state, the Hanford nuclear site contaminated the groundwater. That's not a conspiracy, it's a well-acknowledged reality. We can see here that nuclear sites are distributed throughout destination areas in the Midwest, Appalachia, and the Northeast. On this map, you can see if this site is active or if it has been shut down. At sites that have been shut down, you may want to learn more about the presence and storage of any nuclear products. This gives us some interesting information to weigh as we begin to consider hazards beyond climate. If you're interested in information like this, we're going to have more coming out occasionally in the next year. I think it's particularly important that we learn how to navigate information about water and soil quality. That's an interest of mine. I know that we have many people out there who are very interested in dams and other forms of infrastructure. If you have a hazard class I haven't mentioned in this video that you want to see explored, please email me at ar.americanresiliency.org. Talk about it in the comments section. As we move into an uncertain future, AR wants to bring you the best information that we can. Talk with you again soon, and let's get ready. Folks, thanks for watching. As always, I want to recognize the many people whose contributions are keeping AR going. Our donors, our volunteers, those of us spreading the word online, and those of us doing the work on the ground. As a community update, I want to let you know that you all have given me such comfort and strength as my family faces a serious medical diagnosis. 
If you've been holding us in your hearts, if you've been praying for us, you might like to know that my husband got into one of the clinics he needed on Friday, six weeks before we expected him to be seen. The doctor there says that his symptoms do likely indicate neurodegenerative disease, and she's giving him some medications in advance of diagnosis that should help treat his symptoms, maybe slow the whole thing down a little and improve his quality of life. I'll probably have more information for you towards the end of October. Until then, we're going to just try and keep it together. And I want you to know that I'm not going away. You all have never seen me work when I'm not also doing heavy caregiving. My youngest just started kindergarten and all this comes down. I take pleasure in my work. It matters to me to keep doing my best to get you what you need. Thanks for being with me and I'll talk with you again soon.